Welcome back to the Spirit, Mind and Soul podcast. I have a great one today because I'm in Jen Wilson's studio. Jen Wilson is known as the Healing Rebel and she lives not too far from me in Glasgow. So we got to film in her studio where she basically told me her amazing life story. I've known Jen for a good few years now. Um, and knew a little bit about her story but it was really interesting for her to go into more depth and there was insights for me, things that I never knew. She spoke about her childhood and how she hated school and didn't feel fulfilled and a marriage which ended in divorce and how after living abroad for a few years she came back to Scotland and had to basically start afresh and then goes on to talk about her diagnosis with Crohn's disease which completely changed her life. What a journey she's been on. I hope you enjoy listening to the episode as much as I enjoyed being there chatting with Jen. I'd love it if you could hit the like button, subscribe, you'll be notified when the next episode comes out in a couple of weeks. But in the meantime, enjoy this episode. So hi Jen. Hi Kim. Nice to be here in your studio. I've Thank been here you. many times before for massage, Reiki, access bars, you can talk about used to come yoga as well. I used to come to yoga. <laughs> yep. Um, so we can talk about all of that, but it's nice to be back in your little studio. So, so cozy in here. Thanks for coming. <laughs> and thanks for agreeing to come on and share your story. And I just want to say that I was going to, st- I normally start, um, you know, what, what you've been through a lot of challenges in your life. Mm-hmm. And we we're going to talk about what was life like before, but you've just told me literally <laughs> uh, it, when you were born, it all kicked off. So do you want yeah. to just take, take over? <laughs> so when I was born, I wasn't grieving. Mm. I, my mum was given pethidine while she was in labour, but she was too f- or I was going to say she was too far on. I don't think she was too far on, but they gave her the pethidine and then I decided that I was coming out. And the space it meant that there was pethidine mm. in my system and that caused, I think, a lot of mucus to be there and all my pipes were blocked up with this mucus so that when she did give birth to me, I wasn't breathing and I was then taken away mm. and put through a process to clear that out um, to, yeah. to be able to get me breathing. Yeah. But mum and dad can't really remember because obviously they were young, they were stressed, my mum was in a lot of pain, they don't know how long I was away, but they think it was about 20 minutes, which mm-hmm. when you're an infant, that's actually quite a long time, because you've got mm-hmm. no concept of time, but you just mm-hmm. know that you're not with the people that you had grown with for that last nine months. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, that was like challenge number one. Yeah. <laughs> but, and that's, you know, that's, that stays with you, so that's, yeah. you know, that will still, that's trauma, traumatic mm-hmm. birth that will be in there. Yeah. And obviously, we can talk about how that manifested later in life. Mm-hmm. Um, and then obviously you you lost loved ones and yeah. you know what was school life like? I hated school. Mm. I was uh, and I think this stems back to that first incident when you when you look back at how trauma affects. I because of that experience, I've then come into the world in a in a state of fight and flight. I'm in that sympathetic dominance mm-hmm. because I'm in survival mode, yeah. and I didn't like things to be really busy and I still don't like a, a lot of busyness and a lot of really loud noises unless I'm at a club mm-hmm. and I'm there for intentionally to hear really loud music but if I'm there I don't like people trying to talk to me and I don't like like I wouldn't go in a big group of people and then I used to see groups of people and I'd be like oh I wish I had a group of friends that was all having a laugh but then when I had been like that I was like oh, I don't actually like this mm-hmm. I like just being in my wee bubble in my wee cocoon experiencing life my way mm-hmm. when I was in nursery you, there was a small room and a big room and before you went to primary school they used to put you in the big room to get you more used to that and I hated mm. it and I kept crying and getting put back into the, the small room but then when I went to primary school I was the youngest in my year my birthday was the end of February which meant I was in some instances a year younger than other people and mm-hmm. when you're four or five that can make a huge difference yeah. so then going through school being the youngest in the class not liking the noise I used to want to stay in the classroom I didn't want to go out into the playground because I didn't like all the running about. I wasn't a sporty kid. I wasn't, Mm -hmm. I just wasn't that. I wanted to play in the quiet by myself, being peaceful. And Mm -hmm. I wasn't allowed to do that. Like teachers and the janitor used to come and kick you out, get outside, get outside. And then I would try and find a corner to sit in. And I love watching people, Mm -hmm. like sitting, watching people play and have fun in that way. But I don't want to be a part of that because that's not fun for me. Mm -hmm. And then 
my, I had said to you just before, my aunt died when I was about 11, so that was in, when I was in primary seven. Mm -hmm. And then we moved to the house that she used to live in because my mum had always loved her, loved her house. So when she had passed away, my mm -hmm. uncle had said, look, I'm selling the house, do you want to buy it? So we then moved mm -hmm. from Kirk and Tilf to Bishop Briggs. So it meant I went to a different high school. But I was still the youngest one in the year, but nobody knew me. And obviously hormones kick in when, you's, when you're yeah. 11, 12 years old. So... There was a change and a shift in personality and then when I was about 13 or 14 started drinking and looking back and whether this is true or not starting to drink caused a numbing and a dulling of the fear that I was living in mm -hmm. and, it, and it felt easier to be more playful with the group of mm -hmm. other people. Is that what the fear was? It was just a, a barrier that was up you just didn't want to cross that line and go and join in you were like you say you just stood back and watched and you were happy with that was that a was that the fear it could I don't know I've never thought of it like just obviously as I'm saying those yeah, words yeah. I'm like that's why I was drinking yeah. because it took away that fear that very well and, and then you could join in once you had a mm -hmm. because I was yeah. in that fight or flight state all the time mm -hmm. I couldn't relax and when you look at like oh what's his name Stephen 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 Polly Regal guy <laughs> That's insane. Get it to the polyvagal theory. He says one of the right. best ways to soothe your nerve, your vagus nerve, and your nervous system is through play. Right. But I didn't know how to play as a mm -hmm. child, so I never got that experience and never got to be in that place of fun but relaxed. Right. So that then yeah. went through, started drinking, it numbed that anxiety. Maybe mm -hmm. you could even call mm -hmm. it. It's only recently. I've been in therapy at the end of last year that I was like, oh yeah, no, I, I am anxious. Mm -hmm. I just did never, whether it was I didn't want to give it that label or I just didn't know that that's what it was mm -hmm. because it was my natural state. Mm -hmm. Because I can, although there's elements of anxiety there, I still did a lot with my life. Mm -hmm. Went and lived in Greece and spe like went out there by myself mm -hmm. to a job. But when I was 22, moved out the house lived abroad mm -hmm. that's where I then met my now ex-husband mm -hmm. <laughs> we lived in Greece together and then we moved back here got married here then moved to Australia so I've traveled a lot I've done a lot mm -hmm. so having that fear has actually helped me do a lot of mm -hmm. stuff like yeah. being in that fight or flight because yeah. a lot of that was fight so mm -hmm. fight is some is mm -hmm. doing but then I filled my life with doing stuff mm -hmm. like I have to achieve this and achieve that and then you become that type a driven people pleasing mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and and I was, every time I did stuff it was for other people it mm -hmm. was to prove to other people that I could do it not for myself yeah it's like yeah it's like oh, someone I, I interviewed someone recently and they said it was like accomplishment um syndrome or something where you just feel you're constantly chasing and nothing's ever good enough mm -hmm. and um yeah, so it sounds like maybe because I, I was kind of the same as well. You feel like you need to tick all these boxes. Mm -hmm. You're not really fulfilling what's actually in here. Yeah. So what did you do? What did what was your job when you left school? I went into the travel industry when I left okay. school because you used to have to fill out those questionnaires when you were in like third and fourth year mm -hmm. to help you pick which subjects you were going to mm -hmm. do, and they would tell you what jobs you would be good at, and travel was one of them. And then I remember going to an exhibition fair thing I think it was in the SEC and it was all the colleges and unis telling me about different courses mm -hmm. and I stopped and spoke to one college and they were like talking about the travel and tourism course and at the end of the year you got to go on holiday for a week and mm -hmm. I was like that sounds like my kind of course yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so that was how I picked my life choice was mm -hmm. based on the fact that I got a holiday at the end of the year so I went to college did a national certificate for one year and then got like a ITS job, which is like an apprenticeship job in a travel agent. Um, did that for, ended up working in the travel industry for about 13, 14 years. Because I did, I worked in a travel agency and then I was like, I need to get out of travel. And I went and worked in a take place mm -hmm. for only 10 months. But one of the girls that was there, she used to work as a rep over overseas. 
and I was like I don't want to be at it because I didn't want to stand and talk in a microphone on the bus like I didn't want to be centre of attention mm -hmm. and to be at it you have to be a bit of a show person and that's just not who I was mm -hmm. <laughs> like to sit and watch people so she was like no there's jobs in the office like there's like admin type jobs you are kidding me. Mm -hmm. Got I used to subscribe to Cosmopolitan. Got Cosmopolitan that month that she had said this to me. Looked at was happened to flick through the ads at the back, and there was an ad for admin positions in one of the holiday companies mm -hmm. overseas. So I applied for that and got that, and that's how I ended up going out to Greece. So I lived in Greece two thousand and two, and then did a winter in Gran Canaria, and then went back to Greece the following year. And then by the end of that second year, I was like, I can't do this anymore because you drank six nights a week. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Partied too hard. Mm -hmm. And yeah, my body was just like, you can't do this anymore. Yeah. You have to go back home. And then when I came back home, I worked for a couple of airlines and, and call centre work, but I knew I was moving to Australia because I'd met my now ex-husband then and he was Australian. So I knew that I was going there. So it wasn't, I still worked in the industry, but wasn't mm -hmm. that bothered. Mm -hmm. Spent about nine months traveling we did southeast asia um and then flew into perth in western australia bought a camper van and then drove across the south coast right up to the east coast to um the gold coast where we ended up living so still worked and traveled then and then i couldn't settle there you couldn't settle in australia, in australia no can i just ask as well was there something that you wanted to do when you were younger uh, like a career a job or like a passion that you didn't do that you suppressed well I used to I remember I used to make my own perfume from rose petals and I loved playing like in the garden and in the grass mm -hmm. there was nobody around me that did stuff with nature that did anything I remember being interested in like crystals and essential oils and you used to get they used to advertise on the telly and it was like a series of magazines that you would get in each month there would be a different topic and the first one was always like a pound and then everyone mm -hmm. after that was like five pound or something mm. expensive for those days and I remember getting the aromatherapy one for a wee while and getting something else and I had a book on crystals and I was reading it and they were talking about cleansing the crystals but I didn't know what this means and nobody in my mm. close vicinity knew what it meant so it was kind of that was all then put to the side mm -hmm. and at school I was really good at biology when it was human biology but most of when I did higher biology, it was all about plants. It wasn't about mm -hmm, humans. Mm -hmm. So I completely missed that I was good at that. And because I was, wasn't good at PE, yeah. there was no no other connection to the human body and how the body works. And that was the one part I remember. Because you did a wee bit and came. You did biology. There was the human body digestion system, reproductive system, stuff like that. And then in chemistry, you would do a bit of the digestive system because of the enzymes and how they chemically work in the body. And I remember mm -hmm. my chemistry teacher, because that was the only time that I paid attention in class and was like, I know the answer to this, I know mm -hmm. the answer to this. And he was like, you're alive, like you're awake. Because normally I sat in the class and didn't say anything. Yeah. And I was just like, please let this class be over, please let this mm -hmm. class be over. But I was really engaged in that. But that didn't, like, nobody said, oh, you're really good at this, yeah. this part. It was just, well, you're not very good at the subject overall. Mm -hmm. So it was, you could say, oh, I missed out. I could have been in this career from leaving school, mm -hmm. but then I wouldn't have travelled and I wouldn't have yeah. done all the other stuff. No, so. that's why I asked. It's interesting because you did come back to that, basically. Mm -hmm. you did, yeah. yeah, and it was through having been drunk so much when I was in Greece the first year, I put on so much weight. Like, I was nearly 20 kilos heavier I came mm -hmm. back 20 kilos heavier I had gone out like a size 8 and came back I don't know what size but I was mm -hmm. a lot larger mm -hmm. and people were like oh my god did you swallow a whole person Jen and I'm like no oh. so I started going to the gym mm -hmm. when I came home from Greece the first year and then when I was in Gran Canaria the set up there working was a bit different so I wasn't out partying every night I was only maybe out once or twice a week and then I was going to the gym while I was in so I was doing stuff to look after myself and then when I got out, by the time I got out to Australia, the culture there is very different. Like the gym opens at like five or six o'clock in the morning and you were in doing classes before you went to work. And mm -hmm. I was just more immersed in people who were looking after their health and different ways to look after your health. And I was like, I'm really interested in this. And because I couldn't settle when I was in Australia, there was a, so I went out there 2006. 
at the end of 2005 was when the tsunami had hit, the Boxing Day tsunami had hit mm-hmm. in, the, the, in Asia, Thailand and stuff. So it was very fresh in your mind. When I was sitting in work one day, the whole east coast of Australia had been put on tsunami alert. So straight away I was thinking, this is a major disaster. And my first thought was, I don't want to die in this country. Which was mm-hmm. like one of those, it was that inner voice speaking to me and me going, huh, interesting. Because I knew I wasn't happy, but I didn't know why I wasn't happy. How long was this into you? About a year? Oh, right. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, it would only have been about a year because we spent about nine months travelling. And then I was in, I got a full-time job as a PA in a travel company. And it was when we were in, the, in that job and I hadn't been in that job very long. And I was coming home to Scotland for my cousin's wedding in the July. And see, as soon as I was in Scottish airspace, I was like, oh, I'm going home. Mm. And I was like, oh interesting so then when I was talking to people here while in the time that I was home and they were like oh how are you living in Australia and I was like I don't know where I want to live I don't think it's where I want to live and then when we flew back out I was like this I just this isn't for me so I spoke to um Jake about it and I said to him I was like I just don't think I want to live here and he had been talking about wanting to have kids and I was like there's absolutely no way that I would do that over here because mm-hmm. my support network is all in Scotland. Mm-hmm. I just, it's not even open for conversation. I never wanted kids and I told them that the very first day, but you know that way when you're married and people say you have to make compromises and stuff, they're pretty big compromises mm-hmm. that I was thinking I was going to have to make, but I really didn't want mm-hmm. to make. Yeah. So. Yeah. But you were, you were thinking about it, because I always I remember was, you to, it's one of the first things, I think the first day that we met, <laughs> was you said. It's not something I shy away from, like, I just don't want children. <laughs> yeah, nothing wrong with that. And there isn't, and I'm privileged that we are of a generation that women can make that decision and not be judged for mm-hmm. it, the way maybe our parents yeah. could have been. Mm-hmm. It was much more expected yeah. that you would get married, have a husband, have children, be a wife and a mother, mm-hmm. yeah. whether you wanted to be or not. <laughs> um, so we'd had that conversation and I said, look, let's not go straight away because we'd only been there a year and for me to get permanent residency, I needed to be there for two full years. I said, let's wait until I've got my permanent residency because we might get back to Scotland and I might think, what the hell have I just done? And I, we want to have that flexibility. Mm-hmm. So we waited. So I ended up, I was there for almost three years and we came back home. And then before we left, Jake kept getting sick and he was losing a lot of weight and he was having heart palpitations. He was going to the doctor and they were running tests and they were like, there's nothing there's nothing wrong, there's nothing wrong with your thyroid, there's nothing wrong with this, nothing wrong with that. And I said to him, I was like, that, do you want to move back to Scotland? And he was like, yeah, 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 yeah. My inner, inner knowing knew that he didn't, mm-hmm. but he wasn't, I couldn't force him to admit that. Mm-hmm. so I was just like right okay and he's like no no it's fine we'll make it work we'll make it work so we got back here and then he became very he isolated himself because he did have a good network of friends from when he had been here before and he used to socialise with them and he was part of the Aussie Rules football team And but when he came back that time he didn't do that and he was isolating himself and getting quiet and we were just niggling at each other all the time and we hadn't been like that before so about a year after we'd come back, there was just one day I was like, you just need to have this conversation. And I, I had already spoke to my my best friend about it in the, the previous December. So I'd only been home maybe three or four months. And I was like, I don't think my marriage is going to work. Like, I think Jake wants to leave. Mm-hmm. And he was like, don't be silly. Don't be silly. He loves you. He'll make, it, he'll make it work. It'll be fine. It'll be fine. He just needs to settle back in. And then this was like the October after that. So we'd gone 10 months, say, like, grown apart, grown apart. Eventually, I was like, this is not working. Is it you really want to go home? And he was just like, yeah. Mm. So then we had to have that conversation. And then over a couple of days, he was he was trying to work out, did he just want to go home for maybe six months and then come back or whatever? And I was like, you know, if you go, you're going. And if you want to come back, that's a discussion we need to have at a later time. Mm-hmm. But you can't go saying, I might be back in six months. To then send me a text message and say, oh, by the way, I'm not yeah. coming back. Yeah. So it was like, it's over. Mm-hmm. And if you choose, you choose otherwise, then we can have that discussion. But And he, he was only home maybe a 
week or two and he's like I know I'm probably in the honeymoon period but this is where I really want to be and I'm like that's mm-hmm. fine mm-hmm. like that so it was fine but it also wasn't yeah I was going to say I, I, didn't, I thought your marriage ended and that's how you came back here so that sounds really heartbreaking was that not hard did that not like pull at your heartstrings like he was this guy that you wanted to be with was wanted to be in his own country and you wanted to be here yes but I used partying mm. to suppress mm-hmm. that mm-hmm. because logically it made sense that we couldn't be together and that was really sad he had to be there I had to be there I didn't allow myself to grieve for it mm-hmm. I had to tell everybody that I was fine even though I wasn't because it was the right thing to do mm-hmm. so therefore I, I shouldn't be sad because he was going to be happy and I was going to be happy mm-hmm. so I partied hard mm-hmm. as in the Archies always get <laughs> <laughs> I was contacting them going do you have a season ticket <laughs> because I'm in here like Friday and Saturday every weekend I'm spending a fortune on these tickets and I think a season ticket would be a good idea <laughs> and just I partied hard I was at college at the time so I was in second year at college when we actually split up studying sports yes yeah. so when I came back from Australia I forgot that part <laughs> when I came back from Australia I saw this is a really good opportunity to change direction in my career because when I had been out there I'd been surrounded by all these fit people I'd been mm-hmm. working out myself really enjoying it and I was like maybe I could do that so when I was coming back mm-hmm. I had applied for college to go back and do travel eh, no, not travel tourism <laughs> health fitness and exercise I did mm-hmm. an HND in that mm-hmm. um so I was in second year at college so I had college all the college work that you needed to do I was working in the evenings five days a week and then on the weekends as well and partying so I didn't have time to yeah to mm-hmm. be sad to let my heart be broken mm-hmm. anything like that very destructive behavior mm-hmm. um and I think about 10 months on I had a flatmate who was one of my best friends at the time and we partied together, we were getting holiday together and we started running our own business together. So busy, busy, busy. And then she went away on a family thing for a weekend and I was sitting in the kitchen preparing one of my, my spin classes and all of a sudden I started crying and I couldn't stop and I was like, I can't believe what's wrong with me. Oh my God, what's wrong with me? Like, why am I crying? Why am I crying? So I ended up um, at college, I had been introduced to Brian Costello who who is a NLP practitioner and he had been into college talking to us about NLP because he runs training courses for it and at the time when he had been in I'd been like oh that would be really good for my clients and then I had gone to one of his weekends and then was like actually I need this mm-hmm. <laughs> so I, I reached out to him and I was like I keep crying and I don't know what's wrong and he was like well that's interesting I was about to reach out to you because I'm looking for a personal trainer so we could do a wee swap. So yeah. he's I personally trained him. He did some NLP with me. So mm-hmm. for about, I don't know, six months or something, I was seeing him a couple of times a week to do a personal training and a couple of times a week for me to get therapy and working through all this, mm-hmm. like all the grief process and uncovering those London beliefs when you do NLP yourself, you know, mm-hmm. the, the pow- powerful it is. Um, so that helped me get through that stage of the journey and kind of, kind of start to sort myself out but it's obviously an ongoing journey mm-hmm. and a continuing mm-hmm. journey because I still partied hard for quite a few years after that <laughs> and you don't drink at all now so how did that come about is this when you because we're going to talk about your diagnosis with Crohn's mm-hmm. was the, is that why no 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 okay. no I so Jake left in 2010 and I found Ibiza <laughs> party islands and we went to Ibiza every year, sometimes twice in the year, for the next few years. And I think it was 2014. And any time we had been there, I'd always been like, oh, let me see sunrise. But I'd always be too wasted and fall asleep and miss it. So there was one night I was like, no, I'm definitely going to get the sunrise. So I'm going to go, go. I'm not going to drink tonight. I'm going to set my alarm. I'm going to get up and then go down and watch the sunrise. So I did that. All my friends that I was on holiday with had all... Um, they had all gone out that night so I had got up by myself went down and I was sitting on the beach watching the sunrise and all of a sudden I was like this is what I'm looking for this is that sense of peace in my body I don't want to I don't want to 
party like this anymore. Like I, w I was on that holiday, I wasn't enjoying it as much. I was like, my legs always felt heavy, and I was just like, I'm going through the motions of this, and I should be having fun, and I wasn't having fun. So I decided in that moment, I was like, great, that's it. No more, no more party, party for me. Mm -hmm. So that night we were going out for dinner, and then we were going to go to Pasha, and I was like, okay, I'll go so. I had the best night of my life that night. Mm -hmm. Party, partied without any stimulants and me and my friend stayed right until closing and I was like, let's go and watch the sunrise again. So the two of us then got back to our hotel, went down to the beach, watched the sunrise again. I was like, oh, this is amazing, this is amazing. And that was the, our last night on holiday and that was the last time I've actually been in Ibiza, mm -hmm. um, which is sad, but... Was that the last time you had a drink? That was the last time I had a drink. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so 28th, I think it was 28th, I think it was 14th or 15th of September 2014. I had, and I was just like, no, I'm not doing it. And I still would go to the Archies, but I would take the car and, and some people would, I remember being out with a group of people and I just jumped about and had the best time, even though I was sober. And one of the girls that was out with one time was like, she's not drinking then, is she? And my pal was like, she's not drinking. I was like, Oh my god, because I just had found a way to have fun mm -hmm. without needing anything else. Mm -hmm. So that was 2014. I was single from 2010 up till 2016. And that's when I met Chris. And we kind of kind of knew each other in the gym because we were both members of the same gym. So I used to smile at and say hi in mm -hmm. passing. I thought he was a lot younger than me, so I just thought he was cute. I thought he was dead young. Whatever. Mm -hmm. Turns out it's the same age as me, so <laughs> Um, and there was one one of the guys in reception at the gym used to always be like that's me Jen you need to have a partner like you can't be single and I was just like I'm happy being single I don't care like leave me mm -hmm. alone leave me alone one of my other friends was like but you know what you don't want but do you know what you do want so if somebody was to come you would recognise it and I was like no but I know what I don't want and she was like going to do me a favour going to just make an outline of what you do want from a relationship, what you do want from that person. So I sat and wrote out and I was like, I'm going to get really cocky with this because then this person can't appear and like blonde hair, mm -hmm. blue eyes, dimples <laughs> into the gym so that they're fit and athletic looking but not bodybuilder obsessed with it. Um, funny, well-traveled, blah, 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 blah. And then there was one day... I was coming home from work, I popped into Tesco's to get something to eat. I was tired and hungry and I'd grabbed a bag of beef monster lunch and a bag of spinach, both a combination for dinner. <laughs> and you know that when you're buying stuff, you're like, please nobody see me, please nobody see me. And then I was aware of this person standing next to me at the next till and I kind of looked up and it was Chris and he went, hi. And I was like, oh, hi. More embarrassed about what I was buying than anything else, and shot out. And I was like, after I went out, I was like, oh, I shouldn't have been so rude to him. That was, that was so rude. So when I was in the gym the next time, I said to Osman, I was telling him, and I was like, oh my god, I was so rude to that guy, and explained who he was. And he went, oh, I know exactly who he is, but I haven't seen him for ages. And then about two days later, I got a friend request on social media, and it was Chris. And I had gone into the gym, and Osman was like oh, I saw that guy and I said to him that you didn't mean to be so rude and that you wanted to apologise. So I gave him your contact details and he mm -hmm. said to give you his contact details and I was like, well, he's already been in touch. <laughs> so I said I said sorry to him and then we kind of chatted back and forward on text message. And then he was like, do you want to meet for a cup of tea? So we'd gone up for a cup of tea, went for a walk around Kelvin Grove Park and after he left to go back to work, I was on the phone to my pal going, I've just met the new version of me. Oh my god, what the actual um and he's everything that's on this list. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's unbelievable. <laughs> I know someone else that did that as well. Maybe that's what I need to do. <laughs> yeah, get really it was getting really clear on what you do want rather than just knowing what you don't want. So mm -hmm. he then came into my life, but I still wasn't I still wasn't wanting a relationship. I'm like, yeah, it's fine, go for a cup of tea and hang out or whatever. And it was really mm -hmm. slow to start with. So we've gone for that cup of tea. And then messaged a couple of times in between. And then it was about two weeks later, he had said something about going for another cup of tea. So I think we did that again. And then 
I had, was going to my friend's wedding out in Greece and he had messaged to say, oh, do you want to book a coffee? I said, I'm in Greece just now, but when I get back, I'll let you know and we can maybe mm. catch up. And I was, at that time, I was doing day trips. So I was going to Ben Lomond and hiking by Ben Lomond or going to the Cairngorms or somewhere random, mm. like just getting in the car, driving and having a day out. So I was going to, and I always just looked to see where the weather was good and our globe there. So that I had a sunny day. Yeah. And um, this particular day, I was going down to Lindisfarne which is the Holy Island, right. which is just south of Berwick upon Tweed. So I had said to Chris, I was, he was like, oh, I've not got any clients on Friday. If you're doing anything, do you want me to catch up? And I was like, well, this is what I'm doing. Are you free, free to tag along? Mm-hmm. So we ended up nine hours hanging out together on this whole day. And was, was it a day? It was, but neither of us called it that. Yeah, just, um, let's just go out and I, this is what I'm doing if yeah. you want to come along. So there was no pressure on yeah. it. There was no trying to impress anybody or mm-hmm. anything like that. So that was fine. And then it then started just becoming a relationship, I suppose. Mm-hmm. But I was still in denial. Why was that? <laughs> why, why did we do Why did we? Because I feel like I self sabotage. Were you, is that what you were doing? So, or did I you just pre- have like it a... It was some protection. Was it? Mm-hmm. So you had a guard up, you just didn't mm-hmm. want to let anyone in? Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. But I, I liked hanging out with them, so it was fine. Mm-hmm. Oh, but just, we'll just have the kids mm-hmm. and put them on it. It's fine. Yeah. And then we'd gone out to a concert one night and then to a, another thing the next night and then something else the next day. So it was like two or three nights in a row we'd gone out. And I said, kind of joking, this was, Decem- this was by December. I was like, oh, we must be getting serious if we've been out like all these nights in a row. And he looked at me and went, Getting serious? I was like, You already are. <laughs> That's just like in such denial. Mm-hmm. And I was like, Oh, okay. And then I've got a boyfriend. Oh mm-hmm. my god. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like, shit, shit. And then about a month later, I started getting not well, started getting ulcers in my mouth started going to the toilet a lot, started getting pain and I was like, I don't know what is going on, what's going on. So I'd been I'd been to the doctor and one doctor had run some blood tests and went, the bloods are all fine. There's nothing wrong with you. You're maybe just somebody who gets ulcers. Went away, stuff started getting worse, went back to the doctor and I got a different doctor this time and as soon as I told him my symptoms he went, I think you've got inflammatory bowel disease. And I was like, I don't know what that is, but I think you're wrong, because that sounds serious. Mm-hmm. He's like, we're going to do some more tests, more specific tests. Um, how do you feel about a colonoscopy? And I was like, oh, what is a colonoscopy? And he went, don't send a camera up your bottom. And I went, well, if you need to, <laughs> then you need to. But I mean, if we can avoid it, we can avoid it. Mm-hmm. About a week later, I then got a letter in saying, you have to come in for an emergency colonoscopy. And I'm like, serious because by this time I was like serious I could hardly walk I was in so much pain um he just stood by me the whole time what can I do to help what can I do to help coming up trying to make me food feeding me just sitting with me watching movies everything's gonna be all right everything's gonna be all right got the colonoscopy and they tell you there and then like there's a diagnosis and they're like you've got severe Crohn's colitis so that was me getting that diagnosis and that was March 2017 so we were only six, seven months into a relationship and he was just like, it's fine. We'll just take each day as it comes. Like, mm-hmm. so accepting of it, just so supportive mm-hmm. and wonderful. Mm-hmm. Like, he's ticked all the boxes. <laughs> mm-hmm. um, and that has been my journey since then. So the journey with Crohn's itself has been challenging because I have to be on medication that suppresses your immune system. The first few medications that they tried me on, I took really severe reactions to. So I had anaphylactic reactions to one of them. Another one made my hair fall out. Another one was making me like just throw up constantly. Some of the drugs that they try you on are chemotherapy drugs. So they're really, really aggressive in your system. Um, managed to get all the symptoms under control. Through Although the drugs were having these really horrific side effects, things calmed down as mm-hmm. far as the Crohn's was concerned. So as soon as I was feeling well, I was like to the doctor, I don't want to be on these meds. Like, get me off these medications because I'm now well. I then had a full year where I did keep good health and I was really well. And then my grand died. 
and I was really close to my gran and it was quite quick when she died so although she was 90 she kept and she had emphysema outside of that she kept good health and then at that Christmas time she had she wasn't well so she ended up in hospital with she had a chest infection her lungs weren't working properly it only took 10 days and then she had passed mm. so that was like a big emotional trauma for me a big ugh. I don't know how to deal with grief my aunt had died when I was 11 12 I had been drunk mm. for the rest of the time when both my grandpas died I was drunk I didn't mm. feel I didn't feel I didn't feel I was now sober dealing with this death it's fine I'm just going to process this grief. I have a fucking clue how to do it. So I'm then trying to read books on how to mm -hmm. deal with grief while you're grieving. You can't do that because you have to experience it. You have to process it. You have to go through it. That then triggered a flare. So she passed in the January by the March. I was back in the pits of hell. Couldn't walk. Severe bowel movements. Lost 20 kilos. So I was only about 50 kilos. Like, skin and bone really mm -hmm. really unwell mm -hmm. it's interesting we're recording this and it's um, international ibd day today it is yes. it's just reminded me i need to do a video we, we were supposed <laughs> to as well it wasn't supposed to be today as well i know it wasn't supposed to be today but it is um so yeah really unwell had to go back on medications they put me on diff a different medication that was less aggressive than the first ones that they had mm -hmm. tried me on so i didn't have as many side effects to that one managed to get things back under control because I had things under control, started pushing to come off the medications again. Came off the medications in June, July, August time, 21, I think it was. Fuck. Did you, did you, by this point, were you using holistic sort of methods? Because you kind of changed your, your diet, your life, mm -hmm. obviously to help cope with your Crohn's as well. Yes. So... When I, thank you, <laughs> these things I forget, when I got diagnosed because I didn't want to be on these medications, I was looking for every alternative way to help support my system, like yeah. what can I do, what can I do, and obviously the hospital isn't set up for that, the hospital mm -hmm. is set up to, for acute problems, let's get this medicated, let's get this under control, and then in the case of chronic conditions, they want to just keep you on those medications because it keeps it suppressed, mm -hmm. it's not dealing with the root cause, so... I had um, started working with a medical herbalist because I was on medications. I need, it needed to be a medical herbalist so she knew of the chemical pathways of the meds I was on mm -hmm. to make sure that the herbs weren't going to either suppress the medications or over um, some of them because a lot of medications are made from herbs. If you take some herbs, it's like doubling the dose of the medication and that can be really dangerous and harmful as well. Mm -hmm. So I needed to make sure that I was doing things right um, Chris had applied for an allotment across the road so being out in the garden doing stuff like that so we were getting out into nature and then mm -hmm. I was reading Stephen Porges that's his name the polyvagal guy <laughs> right. started learning about trauma and how that can show up in your body because I'd read um, Bessel van der Kolk's book How the Body Keeps Score mm -hmm. Gabor Mate book When the Body Says No and they mm -hmm. talk about emotional trauma and this life history of sometimes it's your behavior sometimes it's just bad luck of the circumstances you're in but if you're not addressing that and not being able to nourish and look after yourself then it's mm -hmm. going to present and your body will stop you in its tracks and say you need to help me yeah you need to deal with this so i was going down all these alternative therapies reflexology the herbs start i went for acupuncture for a while um using chinese herbs reiki sound healing medicinal mushrooms cambo which is another plant medicine that helps clean out the lymphatic system and um, just did, did they help yes and then no for some of them like acupuncture worked amazingly while i was working with a particular doctor but that doctor then went back to china and his son took over and his son was a completely different kettle of fish mm -hmm. then his dad used to come in he used to come in and stand with me and he put one hand on my shoulder one hand on my leg and just he couldn't speak english but he'd just look in my eye and he'd breathe with me and he'd be like smile it'll be okay his son didn't do that his son came in swipped the towel off stabbed me with the needles put the heat light on and walked out the room there was no eye contact there was no connection there was no bringing peace into me before he started the procedure mm -hmm. that then 
made me more stressed, more anxious. I was I would be lying in the bed going, Oh my god, oh my god. And even where he put the needles in was very different. He'd be like putting them in across my throat and I hated I hate mm-hmm. anything being mm-hmm. on my throat. He's putting them in my scalp and I was like, oh, oh and all that tension is causing more stress in your body. Yeah. So um also I was looking at what cause like looking at what is this condition I've got, it's an inflammatory condition, what causes inflammation in the body, right? Lack of sleep, too much stress, poor diet, although my diet wouldn't be classed, like most people looking at it, like, well, you eat loads of berries and oats and Mm -hmm. yogurts and blah, 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 but I was always doing it on the run because I was going from one class to the next and never sitting down and having a meal Mm -hmm. and being connected to my food started learning about Ayurveda as well which is like the sister science to yoga um, and that looks at you as a constitution so what is your body type what is your your mental capacity as your nature so that you can work out whether or not you are more connected to the fire element or the earth element or the wind element and then when these things go out of balance how do we bring them back in into balance mm-hmm. um, and that works with the seasons and works holistically rather than allopathic mm-hmm. which is just you've got a bowel problem we're sending you to a gastroenterologist who knows lots of things but isn't putting the jigsaw together it's only looking at this one problem in this one area of your mm-hmm. body mm-hmm. where actually there should be the whole thing there should everything. be the whole thing yeah, yeah. so mm, did some talk therapies because of that this could be linked to trauma because I'd had this mm-hmm. big flare when my grand passed away I was like this is a trauma thing this is my body because I don't know how to process grief and there was a lot of self blame Mm -hmm. of I'm not doing good enough and I went I only realized recently that I had gone from this people pleasing high achieving teaching all the classes traveling all the world writing a book blah 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 achieve Mm -hmm. achieve achieve Mm -hmm. to being this sick person who then still in that same mindset I'm going to find how to heal myself and I still went with that same type of Mm-hmm. go getting high achieving I'm yeah. going to achieve this so yeah. the pressures were still there and my body's like you're getting it wrong you're getting it wrong you need to relax mm-hmm. and I'm like I don't know how to relax like I can't I couldn't lie on the sofa and be relaxed mm-hmm. I'd lie on the sofa and be like I could do something else like, there's a washing to be done or yeah. I could read a book or I could be learning this or I could be doing I could be doing I could be doing too much stuff it's like right, how do I just be mm-hmm. and I know you talk a lot about this mm-hmm. about be, be a human being mm-hmm. we're not human doing mm-hmm. and I'm a human doer yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I used to be too yeah yeah <laughs> I had to learn what, well I had to listen to what was in here mm-hmm. rather than what should I be doing what boxes should I be ticking uh-huh. what are the societal expectations mm-hmm. and it's interesting because like my mum and my dad and my gran they're like the three most influential adults in my life they never put pressure on me to be an achiever they were like, do what makes you happy. Mm-hmm. It was my beliefs and expectations that maybe somebody else somewhere else. The society. Society, <laughs> the school system, mm-hmm. like, because I wasn't academic, I didn't like school. The way that they taught just doesn't make sense to me. This sitting still in a classroom with all these people sitting too close to me and mm-hmm. reading a book or whatever, however it is that they teach, yeah. it just wasn't working for me. Mm-hmm. And I was being taught stuff that I wasn't interested in. As soon as I went to college, I excelled. Mm-hmm. And I was like, how is that possible? Because I was rubbish at school. I'm really mm-hmm. good at this. But it's because I was learning what's interested in. Mm-hmm. And I see Chris, um, his sister homeschools um, her kids. And they excel because they are learning what they want to mm-hmm. learn. Like, they can read and they can write and they can do basic sums. Mm-hmm. They speak Polish, they speak English. They're also learning Spanish and also learning mm-hmm. all these other languages. German, I think they were learning as well. And they're doing all these things. And they're thriving because they're learning... Mm-hmm. My son too, I don't know if you know, I'm homeschooling oh, I think I saw that actually yeah. online, mm-hmm. yeah. And, and, it's just kind of, and it's child-led, so he chooses what uh-huh. he wants to, and he, again, he's thriving. Yeah. Both personalities just exactly yeah. rose out. And some people, real, school really works for them. My daughter. And it's, uh, <laughs> yeah. And yeah. it's like, it's doing what's right mm-hmm. for that individual. Mm-hmm. But society doesn't set up for that. Yeah. Society set up for, these Structure. are the rules. Is, yep. These are the rules, this is how yeah. we do things mm-hmm. in life. And you're a success if... You've got the big house, the big car, all the money, blah, blah, blah. Not if you're happy. Yeah. Or <laughs> not if you feel joy in your life and mm-hmm. not if you 
are in service to yourself and maybe others mm -hmm. like how do you show up what what can mm -hmm. you do that helps other people mm -hmm. feel good and feel happy mm -hmm. and sometimes that is amazon yeah. but sometimes it's not yeah. like that's fine for jeff bezos or mm -hmm. whoever that's fine for them but don't tell us that that's how we have to live our mm -hmm. lives working mm -hmm. for minimum wage being your slave <laughs> yeah 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 this could and be a whole other podcast I know. Maybe <laughs> might need to do one. but you know you you say and, and i know that you're hard on yourself about all these qualifications that you go and get yes but you made a really good point to me because you said you work with women and you know you tailor what so you've got you know you do your access bars you do reiki massage yep. you know pilates yoga that's that's good because then you've got those skills to tailor because not a woman's not going to come to you and just you know reiki is going to be the thing that just works for her it might not be it might mm -hmm. be one of your other so that's it's really good you've got that flexibility mm -hmm. that you can tailor to yeah women whatever they need yeah. for whatever's going on in their life at that point mm -hmm. do you want to talk a bit about the work that you do then and what sure. you're currently doing what, in your little studio yeah so one of the like after did while i was doing college um i did my nlp practitioner training because mm -hmm. i thought this is really useful mm -hmm. um i don't work with people or like in a counselling capacity mm -hmm. um if somebody came to me and they were like oh my head's in this blah 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 i can talk to them about some stuff but I would rather send them to somebody who that's what they are, mm -hmm. their area expertise is, and that's what their thing is. But I have that as an underlying, mm -hmm. and it's really useful to be able to use in how I speak to people, how I ask questions, mm -hmm. how I'm able to hear the language that they're using, and then be able to be like, right, okay, this is what your belief is. How do mm -hmm. we tweak that belief without mm -hmm. me being, and I try as much as possible to not be like, you're wrong, this is how you should do it. It's more a, well, mm -hmm. what would work for you, or... Mm -hmm how about we try it in this slightly different way and that's whether it's movement practice so I, I mean I've been doing some videos recently on my social media talking about bringing your feet into hip width wait in pilates that's a thing like your starting point is with your feet at hip width but for some people this completely parallel feet hip width feels horrible on their hips and the knees and their ankles so let's just change that position and take it mm -hmm. slightly out mm -hmm. let's break the rules because when you're in pt school they're like this is what the setup is, this is how people should move, blah, blah, blah. But then you go out in the real world and you're dealing with real people and you're mm -hmm. like, hang on a minute, that's not how it works. So mm -hmm. how can we make these tweaks and changes? It's the same with when I'm teaching people or, do, or doing practices. And if somebody comes to me for Reiki and they've never been for it before, this doesn't feel right. And I know you had this experience. This doesn't feel right. Stay straight away. Don't, mm -hmm. don't lie there feeling anxious because it might be that the order we do something as needs to be changed or this might not be the right treatment for you and that's mm -hmm. okay mm -hmm. because for a long time I thought that if like I find meditation really difficult sitting down being quiet just sitting with my breath because I get agitated and I'm much better going across development and looking for nettles looking for dandelions like looking for something so that I'm focused mm -hmm. I'm not in my head thinking mm -hmm. but it's like where can I be in that flow state where can I be in this non-thinking state mm -hmm. for some people it is sitting with the breath but just because you can't doesn't mean that there's something mm -hmm. wrong with you mm -hmm. it's just not the right thing for you yep. um sound therapy as well I had one of I had a client in we were going to do a massage and I was like I'm going to try a wee bit of sound, sound with you soon as I hit the the bowl I was like oh that sounds really funny and she was like no nope, no nope, no nope, you have to stop have to stop that's it's like nails down a blackboard and it was just that sound wasn't resonating with her and Partly that was how her energy was resonating, but also when the ball was hitting, it was trying to find the frequency and it just, mm, it was ricocheting rather than being able to resonate. So we didn't, we stopped that straight away mm -hmm. and we went to some grounding practices and went into the massage in a different way using essential oils and mm -hmm. um, breathing techniques for her. So mm -hmm. having all these different skills does, as you said, lets me really tailor and tweak things. So that's the movement practice. Yoga is the same, you know, you see people doing all these fancy yoga poses on Instagram. A lot of people can't do them because their bodies just don't bend into those shapes. If you're a 20-year-old gymnast, mm -hmm. you're going to look one way. If you're a 40-year-old woman that's holding weight around the middle, your body's going to move a different way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, the Reiki, the massage, the access bars. So you've had access bars mm -hmm. um, done as well. Yeah. A lot of people haven't heard of that one. Um, it's fairly new in the last 15, 20 years. And that's a type of energy healing where we only work 
like a touch points on our heads mm -hmm. and it's like press and control alt delete in your mind so it just mm -hmm. shuts off that internal mm -hmm. chatter and allows you space to think because mm -hmm. often when we're thinking we can't get clear in our thoughts because it's all this oh but you've got to help me you've got to help me. all that channel oh this person will think this about you or that person mm -hmm. will think that and it's like shut up give yeah. me space to think let me get clear um so there's that lovely that lovely treatment and then helping people work out of all the different stuff that you can do what's right for you how do we find that pathway because everybody mm -hmm. claims that their way is the right way and i'm like might be for certain people but mm -hmm. also might not be for mm -hmm. lots of other people yeah. so it's like how do we navigate that space and sometimes I'm the right coach that can help guide you through that and sometimes mm -hmm. I'm not and I'm actually I'll be like mm -hmm. actually I know somebody who's be, who's going to be much more tuned mm -hmm. into what you need right now so let's send you that way mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. so what about the future then what's what's the plans for the future and the work that you're doing I am um, in the process of re-editing my first book so my first book was nine rules to sort your shit mm -hmm. i am editing that just because when i first did it i got my mum to proofread it for me and when i was recording the audiobook i'm like oh, i've missed loads of commas in here because <laughs> i write how i speak and i don't yeah. always pause to take a breath mm -hmm. as you might have just noticed <laughs> And that's how I write. So I'm like, oh, that doesn't really work out. So it's so with it. So I need to fix that. There's a few wee things that I just want to tweak mm -hmm. in the book. So I'm working on that just now. I've also got a new book that I'm working on, um, which is the healing rate. It's based on the healing rebel stuff. Mm -hmm. So it's about different healing mo modalities. How do you work out what ones are mm -hmm. going to be right for you? And I haven't got a title for that yet because it's still. I've got all the chapters of it, which I had done as which i've done as a course but it's taking the chapters and tidying them up mm -hmm. and the healing rebel is that not yes. a nice um title it is but it needs to be sub mm -hmm. sub title mm -hmm. so is it the healing rebel is that the name it's of it? well it, it is something to do with the healing okay. rebel okay. whether it's nine rules to yeah, or so. something else i don't know what mm -hmm. the, the next part of it is um so i'm working on that just now to just help people mm -hmm. Work. Is it Crohn's? Is it, are you, will you be talking about your Crohn's? I will be talking a bit about Crohn's. I actually, on Tuesday, I got told I had endometriosis and cis, I cyst on each of my ovaries as well. So I'm collecting mm. health conditions at the moment, but they're all inflammatory conditions. They're all stress-related. So it's, what can I do? Like, how can I be more being? How can mm. I learn more? So I'm, I'm learning. I'm yeah. into that stage where I'm possibly perimenopausal as well. So I'm like... There's so much and you can give, you can say to somebody, oh, this will help with this particular condition. But every health condition, the underlying pro problems of it is inflammation. Whether it's mm -hmm. menopausal symptoms, PMS symptoms, whether you've got a chronic health condition that's been given a label of inflammatory bowel disease or endometriosis or MS or arthritis or mm -hmm. any of these other things, they're all inflammatory conditions. So how do we calm our bodies? How do we soothe our bodies? how do we start the path without thinking oh look how far advanced you are it's like how do we start where you are mm -hmm. what's the first step that you can take so that you don't feel overwhelmed on this journey and it might be for somebody that they just stop drinking coffee every day maybe but maybe not or it might be cutting down on how much wine they drink or changing the order that they have their meals in a day like because mm -hmm. i found having two meals in a day works better for me and having my main meal in the middle of the day and something smaller later on in the day that's what works for me mm -hmm. but for somebody else it might be in a different order or they might need to eat, eat more frequently or less frequently or yeah. it's um helping people mm -hmm. navigate all of that yeah mm -hmm. so what about and it's always a question that i just want because we're talking a lot about obviously your journey and your work as well but what about just for you i want to know if there's something that's in the future that you're longing for that's just for you i want a piece of land that's near water that we can put an off-grid type dwelling on it so that i can go paddle boarding and mm -hmm. we can grow food and maybe have people come to like from a business thing maybe have people come to camp mm -hmm. and do some nature stuff with that but 
more importantly, us to have that space mm -hmm. that's a wee, because I've lived just on the edge of the city and I've, it's noisy and it's mm -hmm. constant, the energies. <laughs> and when yeah. my nervous system is, <laughs> it just amplifies mm -hmm. that. So I want mm -hmm. somewhere that's away from that that we can. So giving this up? I think? don't know. I don't know. Maybe having both. Maybe having both initially and then deciding because one one of my fears is that I move to the country and then be like, oh shit. Mm -hmm. <laughs> There's nothing here. So I would keep both initially to mm -hmm. see what works better and then maybe mm -hmm. maybe tack this mm -hmm. on. Maybe not. Who knows? <laughs> Well, thank you for being so open and sharing everything that you've My shared. Pleasure. Um, and obviously I'll put details on how people can read your book and get in touch. And anyone in Glasgow, I encourage you to come and visit Jen's studio. She's got lots. We'll put all your amazing services below yes. as well, just so that they can see what you've got on offer. And it's a lovely little space here. And thank you for letting me come and film. Thank person. you for coming. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for listening to another episode of the Spirit, Mind and Soul podcast. All details on how to contact Jen are in the description below. You can head over to her Instagram as well and show your support. I have another amazing podcast guest for you in two weeks time. So keep an eye out for that. Subscribe and you'll be notified. And if you enjoyed this episode, give it a little like as well. Every little helps me grow this podcast. Thanks again for listening and we'll see you soon.